नाम जप मेरे साजन से नाम जप मेरे साजन सेना नाम जप मेरे साजन सेना नाम नाम जप मेरे ओ साजन मेरे साजन सेना हो मेरे साजन मेरे साजन सेना नाम जप नाम सतनाम वाहे गुरु 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 सतनाम वाहे वाहे गुरु 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 तन वाहे गुरु 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 सतनाम वाहे गुरु सतनाम वाहे गुरु सतनाम वाहे गुरु सतनाम वाहे गुरु नाम जप मेरे साजन से जी नाम जप मेरे साजन से नाम बिना मैं अवर न को नाम बिना मैं अवर न को वड
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Satsang. So nice to see you. Wow. Um, soon we'll be celebrating a master's reunion with God. And it's, it's a great celebration that he joined Baba Sawan Singh on the 23rd. And on the 23rd, is, I'm joining the Isha celebration. And that night, there is a Sisha Satsang. So uh, it's just going to be a day full of grace where we really, I mean, we already feel the presence every moment of Master, but it will be probably intensified because there are so many hearts joined together. So I'm looking forward and let me read the schedule of today. Um, wow, it's a gorgeous schedule. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, it looks like a Persian carpet, <laughs> Master. Oh, I loved it. And uh, okay, it says, Shabd by Sister Nisha, my master has come to me. Oh, then there are a <clears throat> few words by me. And then there is a reading by Sister Shalina titled The Court of the Lord. Wow, The Court of the Lord. And then we're, uh, I picked a random uh, video of our Holy Father Ishwar Puriji, and we're all going to melt in his love. So, Oh, looking forward for all the blessing that will be showered on us today by our Holy Father. Oh, so let's start with uh, the Shabd from uh, Nisha. Radha Swami, the title of today's hymn is My Guru Has Come to Me. My Guru has come to me and I sacrifice my everything at his feet. I place the form of my master in my heart so that whenever I can open my eyes, I can have his darshan. He has freed me from the cycle of 84. At his door is only happiness. There are cues of disciples, and the Master spreads all the joy and happiness to everyone. I touch the dust of his feet to my forehead, sit next to him, and tell him all my sorrows. Doing so brings so much peace and joy to my heart. My Master has come to me, and I feel so blessed. Mein Sat Guru Tere, Sat Guru Aaye, Saate Vedi, Main Balihari, Sat Guru Tere, Guru Ji Aaye, Saate Vedi, Aina Guru Nu, Main Dil Vich Vasa Lava, Nain Khola Te, Darshan Pa Lava, Kat Din Din E, Chora Si Ghedi, Guru Ji Aaye, Saate Vedi, मैं बलिहारी सत गुरु तेरे गुरु जी आए साडे वेरे गुरु दे दरते मौज बहारा संगटा आईया बन कटारा वंड दीन दीने खुशियां देखेडे गुरु जी आए साडे वेडे मैं बलिहारी सत गुरु तेरे गुरु जी आए साडे नेडे धूले चरना दी मैं मत्थे लालवा 
कोल बैठ के मैं दुखड़े सुना लवा खुशियां पावंगे ओ दिल विच मेरे गुरु जी आए साडे वेड़े मैं बलिहारी सतगुरु तेरे गुरु जी आए साडे वेड़े मैं बलिहारी सतगुरु तेरे सतगुरु आए साडे वेड़े सतगुरु आए साडे वेड़े थैंक यू मास्टर थैंक यू लॉर्ड राधा स्वामी thank you lord thank you sister nisha for your beautiful voice and your wonderful shabd and the great words in the song my master came to me and made me happy forever that since we meet the master the ruler he rules over the hearts of the people with love master rules over all the hearts of the people and that's how a true one a true one who beholds the love who owns love who owns god who owns the kingdom of god rules over the hearts of the people and ishwar puri ji ruled over our hearts with his love with his love he just took our hearts he we fell in love with him and once we fell in love with god then what happened what happened to us then slowly 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 he starts to reform us that if we if we just give if we just follow the steps of what what master wants from us and he wants us to reform ourselves and sheikh farid says god says if you reform yourself you shall meet me and meeting me you shall be at peace meeting me you shall be at peace that when we find the perfect master when we're connected with the shabd and when we reform ourselves the most important thing is to reform ourselves we have to reform ourselves that that the reformation of the self is a requirement on the path of love that all the vices in us have to go away and once we reform ourselves and our hearts become white then we meet god then we meet god inside of us we meet him outside and we meet god inside of us and by meeting god we will be happy we will be at peace we will be at peace i know a lot of people in this world are suffering some are suffering from horrible diseases that it's hard for them to to really use the body because of so many ailments and what is the solution for that what is the solution for that that really we should know that every every occurrence in our life is a blessing in disguise everything that the human being goes through is to take him a step forward to god and to unburden him from a lot of burdens that the soul carries so every every disease that we go through really if we look deep into it it's just releasing us it is just it is from the point of pain that we have that the light enters that from the wound from the wound and from our pain that crack brings the light of god in because then we start to wonder why are we here and why are we suffering and is there is there a solution to my suffering and then yes there is a solution because this year this asking the seeking brings the light of god and the light of god comes how it comes in the form of the holy light and the holy sound the shabd the naam and that shabd the naam that sound of god that sound of god is harmonizing it reforms us from within but it doesn't just reform our anger our greed our lust our ego and our attachments 
it also harmonizes every cell in our body and frees us from all diseases, from all sicknesses and from all pain. Really, really, it is true. It is true that once we get the holy light and the holy sound from within and we start our inner journey and we are connected with the Shabd, the Shabd really is the burner of all karma that the holy sound, once we listen to it, it burns so much karma that really releases us and then we can enjoy. And this holy light and the holy sound really teaches us how to die, that we don't have to kill ourselves to enjoy the heavens or to release ourselves from this body, that once we learn how to die, we can begin to live. So the saints and masters, they give us a way out from here in which we can, through meditation, we can release ourselves from this body and tap into the higher regions, tap into the astral, the causal, the super causal. And when we become pure, we can go beyond time and space. So all these gifts are being given to us. So many people, so many people who, uh, who uh, there are stories, stories of saintly people. Uh, and there is a story of one person with Baba Sawan Singh who was uh, really suffering a lot of sicknesses in his body. And he knew with the power of concentration, how to concentrate here at the third eye center and with the, with the help of uh, the master and the holy light and the holy sound, he could release himself from the body, which is the act of dying. He could free, have an out of body experience and go to the spiritual plane, leave his body behind, the suffering body behind, and then enjoy in the higher regions. And then Baba Sawan Singh told him, listen, you have to go down to your body and suffer the karma, pay off the karma, uh, 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 pay off your karma because that karma has to be paid off. So our karmas have to be liquidated and whatever karma God gives us, sometimes it's really hard karma that we are going through, but everything has a beginning, everything has a middle and everything has an end. Any, every karma that comes, ultimately it has to go. Ultimately, it has to go. And with prayer, with prayer, there are all types of miracles that come from God. If we deeply, deeply pray from the depth of our heart, then at the right time, God is going to free us from this karma. He is the doer. Master is the doer. And every karma is in his hand. He gives the disease. He gives the pain. And he takes the pain. He is the beginning, the middle, and the end. And he can do, he can do all that power is within God and he can do everything for us, but he will do it at the right time. The only thing that we have to keep the faith, we have to keep the faith and the trust in God. By faith and trust in God, everything can be done. Everything can be done. St. Kirpal says that no is only in the dictionary of the fools. So we have, we have to become positive from inside. We have to be positive from inside, keep our thoughts on God, on master, and, and seek, pray for one thing, to get the gift of the holy light and the holy sound, because that gift of the holy light and the holy sound will, will release us from all our diseases, all our worries, all our pains. And then as Sheikh Farid says, you shall be at peace. You shall be at peace. You shall be at peace because everything will be under the control of the love power and not the Maya power. When we are under the control of Maya or Cal, then we're always suffering. But when we connect with Shabd, when we connect with love, when we find the perfect master, when we are on the way of love, then what happens? What happens? Then God really pulls us from within, pulls us from within into higher stages, and then we will be finding peace inside. Once we find the peace inside, then it will reflect on our outer life, and our outer life will be at peace. Our outer life will be at peace, and it will be harmonious. It will be harmonious. So for, for, for the people who are suffering, then I really, I really, really beg them, please, Pray in your inner self to get the gift of the holy light and the holy sound. Once you have that gift of the holy light and the holy sound, then 
then it will be learning how to die so you can begin to live. We will learn how to die on daily basis and enter within and free ourselves from the body for a while and enjoy the bliss and the harmony inside. When we come back into the body, we will bring that bliss and that uh, we will bring the bliss, we will bring the joy, we will bring everything good from God into this body. So the most important thing is that we have to keep ourselves positive. Only think of positive things. If we are sick, then we concentrate on thinking of being healthy. My body is the body of God. My body will be healthy. My body will be good. My body will be free of all sickness. My body is the temple of God. My body is having the vibration of God. My body belongs to my master. My body is, will be prepared by master for meditation. Once in the most important thing is those positive affirmations in our life to keep the positive affirmation and never think of the, the negative. Because when we think of the negative, we manifest the negative. We manifest that negativity in our life when we think of it. But once we have, once we start to think only positive thoughts, only positive thoughts, nothing else is allowed that I am healthy, I am strong, my body is the temple of God, then then every positivity will be added onto us. So yes, yes, and I have tested this path. I have tested this path for many years. And I found out, I found out that whenever I have any sickness, whenever I have any sickness, I really, even though all my family are doctors and tell me they, I remember times when I had extreme pain where it was 10 out of 10 in my, in my, uh, in my stomach. And my brother, he's a doctor and he's like, go to the emergency room right now. And why I, I did not, I said, no, I have master inside of me. My inner doctor is inside of me. And I connected with the Holy Shabbat. I sat in meditation. I connected with the Holy Shabbat. And what did master do? He took my pain. I was okay. I was okay. I didn't have to go to the emergency room. I didn't have to go to the hospital. I didn't have to go into those areas where there is a low vibration that is not a healing vibration. And the best healing vibration is from within us. So yes, master inside of us is the doctor of all doctors. The king of doctors is inside of us. We just have to have full trust and full faith in the king of all doctors and connect with that doctor inside of us. And really, really, when we connect, then we have heard thousands of stories of miracles that happen when people pray deeply from the depth of their heart to God and how God answers back by releasing them of their pain. We have to be patient. The most important thing on the path of spirituality is we have to be patient. Everything has its time. Everything has its time. And, and the only way, the only way to release ourselves from the pain and the, for people who are very sick, sometimes the thoughts, the negative thoughts of killing myself, of suicide comes. And these thoughts, these thoughts are negative. They are from Cal and they only bring suffering. Why? Because if anybody kills himself, then what happens? They become a ghost and they will have to spend the rest of the time of their body. If they were supposed to live 80 years and they killed themselves at 20, then there is 60 years of being a ghost and having to suffer that life of being a, a ghost, which is a horrible life because uh, nobody, the, the Ishwarji said that the ghosts, they, they can hear us, they can see us, but we can't hear them or see them. So they try to speak to us, but we don't hear them because, um, uh, because they don't have a physical form. So, so this is not a good solution. The best solution is to have, to have the firm, firm prayer in God that he will heal me at the right time. And whatever he sends, let's take it as a gift of him releasing us from big burdens, from big burdens and taking us closer to him. So whatever is coming towards us with folded hands, we should say, thank you. You know what's better for me. God knows what's better for us. If he, has give us, if he gave us a disease and pain, that's for a certain reason. And, and God knows what's best for us. And, and he knows the correct time when it has to be taken out. So yes, it will be taken out. But the best thing that any satsangi could do 
is the process of the self-reformation, that the self-reformation that Farid talks about, if you will be mine, the whole world will be yours, O oh Farid. In the, in the Bani of uh, Sheikh Farid, it says, if God is talking to Farid and he's saying, if you will be mine, the whole world will be yours. That really, the, 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 the ones who do the seva for God all the time, day and night, they're doing seva, selfless service, and they're thinking of God, and they're meditating, and even their meditation becomes selfless service because they offer it to God. They offer their meditation to God. They offer their body to God and everything they have to God. And day and night, they are serving the Lord. Then what happens? Then they become for God. That Ofarid, he who reforms himself, amends himself, I become of him. I go and set my residence within him. If he, if he makes me his very own, a time come, the entire world becomes his. So really seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else shall be added unto you. That I know this path is a long path and we have to be very perseverant and very patient. However, however, the time will come, the time will come where all our vices will be knocked out by the sword of love of master. It might take many, many years. It might take 40 years. It took Hafiz 40 years and 40 nights with him. He, he, he was working on himself, working on himself, being patient, accepting whatever God sends his way and loving his master, increasing his love and devotion, which is the secret to the entry of the kingdom of God. But after the 40 days, 40 nights and 40 years, Hafiz melted into God and became God. And then when he became God, the whole world became for him. The whole world became him. He became a totem. He became totem. So this, this possibility of becoming one with everything, one with God, one with the ocean of love is our birthright. And all what we have to do is reform ourselves or offer ourselves to the master so he can reform us. We offer ourselves to the master through the seva and through the meditation and through helping and serving all our spiritual family. And this is the way, and we have to be patient, perseverant. And one day, one day, just like a domino effect, just like a domino effect, if one of the vices like anger falls out, then directly all the other vices like a domino effect will fall. So one, like attachment, if attachment falls, then it will knock anger off, it will knock lust off, it will knock greed off, and it will knock the ego off. And once all these are knocked off, pure at heart are the ones that shall see God, that shall live with God and be with God 24 seven. All the time, we will have the inner master. All the time, we will have access to all the creation of Lord God and, and to all what he created. And this is the life that he wants for us. Let me read to you a poem from Mira. Mira wrote a poem, uh, and I, I read it this morning when I just opened, and it was a beautiful poem. And it says, it says, it says is all this stuff real? And it says, and she's, because she's, a, she's talking to her girlfriend and she's saying, girls, think twice before inviting God near. His charms will turn you into a slave. Are you ready for such a wonderful bondage? This is what happens when master steals our heart with his charms, that he starts to rule over our hearts. He steals our heart. And what happens? What happens to his devotees, his lovers? They become slaves. Slaves, in what that means, that means they want to only serve him. They only want to serve his lovers. They only want to gain humility and become like him, to become like him. He's the servant of all servants. That's why he's the owner of love, that he served, he served the servants of God, and then he gained that level of exalted humility. 
of utmost humility. And that utmost humility, God took residence in his heart, and then he ruled over our hearts. And when, and, and Rabi and the Mira says, girl, think twice before inviting God near. His charms will turn you into a slave. Are you ready for such a wonderful bondage? What if your human lover is just about ready to insert a pulsating mass into your forest and reign there? What if just he slash she enters, you hear his flute calling? Could you run outside in a second naked and ready for the world to make fun of you? For, for who can really see him? Everyone may think you are worshipping a mirage. And what if he asked you to give all your gold bangles and fine cloth to the next beggar you see? Did you not hear that story I once said that there was a lover of a master and he was very, very rich. I think I, uh, he, he was a very, very rich man. And uh, there was a man who came to the master and asked master for money for the wedding of his daughter. But the master said, I don't have money, but all I can give you are my shoes. And the person took the shoes and he was very, very dissatisfied of the gift that the master did not give him money, but gave him shoes. As he left the ashram of the master, then there was this caravan of the rich man who was coming with camels and so much money. And he could smell his master's shoes. He could smell the fragrance of his master. And he said, where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? And there was only that poor man that had a bag with him. And he said, uh, I smell my master. Where, where, where is that fragrance coming? And he said, yes, I have his shoes. And, uh, and he said, will you give me those shoes for all, all this caravan and all these camels and everything that I own? And, and he said, yes. And the, God, the, the person got the, all the money and, uh, and the lover of God got the shoes. And he was happy with those shoes that the lovers of God will do everything to hold their master's shoe and keep it forever because it's really the treasure of all treasures to have the shoe of master or anything from master with us that he gave it that he gave it to us the lovers cherish it and hold it for eternity and that becomes their wealth that becomes their wealth that they don't care about anything from this world but to have one thing of master one thing of master and the lovers of master, the lovers of God, I'm sure master gave them a lot of gifts, a lot of gifts that they cherish and they will keep forever because these gifts are, have no price. They are priceless. They are coming from the Lord. And their purpose is to remind us of the Lord, that when we look at these uh, objects, these material objects that came from master, it reminds us of master. It reminds us of master and brings his heart close to our heart. And when the two hearts become close, so close, so close, so close, they become one at some point. They become one. That the love, the love, that the king of love, the emperor of love, when he loves us, his love is also a pulling love. It pulls, it pulls our heart to his heart. And those hearts become one. Those hearts become one. Me and my father in the heavens are one. Or Anna al-Haq, as all the saints and masters who knocked all, all, who knocked all the obstacles away, and who went beyond time and space? They could see. They could say, "Anal Haq, they are the truth because they became the truth, and the truth is love, and the truth is melted with them from inside and from outside. They become truth. Truth is love, and they behold God. And to behold God is to be at peace. To be at peace." in this life and for eternity. So the most important thing is not to waste the human life, not to waste the human life and to use it to find God. That every moment is a very precious moment that could be used to find God. Oh, let me just finish the poem and then we can continue on. Giving him our day, our clay, our body to shape is one thing for this can excite us. But when our jewelry and silk are at risk, surely it is, it is time to be seriously asked, is this, 
is all this God stuff real? That yeah, if we if we uh, it's a it's a process. It's a process, and ultimately, ultimately, the lovers of God, the lovers of God, when all the greed is knocked out, they are ready to give everything for God. As Rumi says, they gamble uh, gamble everything on God. Gamble everything on God. And Rumi gambled everything on God. And then what happened to him when he gambled everything on God? Then God become, became him and the whole world became him. No, not only the whole world, the three worlds and all the creation of Lord God became him. So it's a process. It's a process. And it's only for the brave. Brave at heart are the ones that are ready to gamble everything for God. But it's a process. It's a process. We go through step by step by step by step. And he reforms us, he makes us, and he molds us. And ultimately, we will reach the rooftop of creation and we will enjoy forever. Um, this is all what I wanted to say today. And thank you, Master, for the seva. And I'm looking forward to see all my holy family in a few days. And just enjoy the presence of Master. Melt in his love. Melt in his love. Um, oh, yeah. And now... Uh, it is. Uh, uh, we're gonna uh, play the seva of our dear sister Shalina, and I'm really looking forward for her seva. Thank you to the Daily Satsang Committee for enabling me to perform seva for my master. Today I read to you a essay from the rssb.org and it is called In the Court of the Lord. Many of the shabads or hymns in the Indian Sant tradition were written along with the melodies by the saints themselves. They are therefore legacies of God-realized beings and have a unique freshness and impact. The truths the saints have realized are set down in a very pure and concentrated fashion so that each word springs from active realization. Unlike text which can be rewritten or reinterpreted by priestly agendas, the Shabbats have remained unchanged for hundreds of years because each word, as it was set down, is part of the melody. Words and music are, in, are inextricably linked, just as with the inner Shabbat, light and sound are one. The well-known Shabbat discussed in this satsang is from the teachings of Paltu Sahib, Paltu was a shopkeeper saint in the highly orthodox religious town of Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh during the 18th century. Maharaj Charan Singh Ji in his discourses about Paltu describes him as fearless because he did not spare the priests and religious leaders when he explained the path of the saints. Consequently, Paltu at the age of 70 was burned alive for what was perceived as heresies. And what is it that the worldly are the ways that the world can't stand? The truth. The saints teachings are very simple. This is not our true home. Our true home is the abode of the Lord, Sachkhand. That is where our innermost being is based. Sachkhand is a state of consciousness. And a state of consciousness can be achieved anywhere. We do not have to go to a strange land to find it, nor do we have to pay money, wear special garbs, or go through an official priesthood. We're not just creatures of mind and matter, because if we were, we'd be robots. Proof of the existence of surat or soul is that we're not like artificial intelligence. We're not robots. We have an extra dimension. We are surat, soul being, loving consciousness captured in physical form 
which is yearning to return to its true home. As human beings, we all have this chronic nostalgia in one form or another, a longing to return to a former time or state, a belief that things are not as good as they were in the good old days, a feeling that we cannot put into words. Now that root meaning of nostalgia is from the Greek meaning pain from an old wound. This chronic nostalgia affects our behavior and leads us to look for distractions and solace or to seek happiness in the physical world when in fact we are connected to this world only through our previous actions, their reactions and desires. The Lord is inside every one of us in the form of light and sound, the Shabbat. Our journey is to make conscious contact with the sound and light within and gradually realize through spiritual practice that firstly, we are soul beings and secondly, the soul and the Lord are one. The saint or true living master is the key to our return home. He is a wave of the ocean of the Lord in a human birth. The master initiates us by establishing a conscious link with him inside his Shabbat form. He teaches us how to meditate and what to meditate on. He requires a necessary foundation for this path through four vows. Strict vegetarianism. We are to live a moral life and not to dissipate our discrimination with alcohol or mind-affecting drugs. These three lifestyle vows are prerequisite for the fourth vow. The commitment of meditating two and a half hours each day which is a tenth of each 24 hours. Now in four simple wows, we get the whole package, a lifestyle that addresses every aspect of our being, physically, mentally, and spiritually, without the complications of rites and rituals. The saints assist us both inside and out, like a mother watching and training a child. Through his grace and our effort, he promises we will ultimately achieve liberation from mind and its delusions and from matter and finally return home. Here's a lovely quote from Huzur Maharaji in the light of Santmat. First comes the grace of God, then the company of saints, and then the acquisition of the secret of Nam, then by constant application and unceasing devotion comes the actual realization of Nam. Margie used to say that sincerity and honesty in our effort again provoke his grace to make more effort. However, hopeless that we feel that we are and actually are in our efforts to concentrate. There is a magic about sincerity. To keep us straight and God-focused in our daily lives, we repeat the five holy names given to us at the time of initiation. The masters say repeatedly, Simran is the key. Again, in Light on Santmat, Marji writes, Regarding the repetition of the five holy names, it's not just a repetition for the sake of breaking the habit of the mind and inculcating obedience. In fact, these names, if properly repeated with devotion, stir up spiritual vibrations and bring you in contact with those inner regions through which the soul has to pass on its way up to Satlok. Eventually, the masters say, Simran will permeate our subconscious and emerge consciously and automatically when we are not concentrating on something else. It will pop up. Thoughts too are external, although they are going in our, they're going on in our head. Their subject matter is external. Do we want to spend our meditation time dwelling on externals and strengthening them? This is why Babaji has said, if we dwell on things in our meditation, instead of eliminating them or deleting them from the computer of our mind, we are essentially reprogramming them back into our minds and strengthening them. And we need to keep bringing the attention back to Simran. And 
to reinforce our commitment to meditation and enhance our spiritual awareness, we attend satsang. Margie gives us the reasons for that too. The object of satsang is twofold. To non-satsangis, it provides an opportunity of seeking the truth, removing their doubts, and arriving at a correct understanding, thus realizing the importance and significance of Santmat principles. Now, for satsangis, it creates or strengthens the yearning for going in, and it helps to concentrate the mind. The real satsang is the hearing of the Shabad within. Yet, nevertheless, in order for this world to continue, the saints' teachings end up becoming bent and externalized into ritual, dogma, and practices. The saints themselves often get persecuted. However, no power can stop a saint from collecting his flock, his marked souls for that life. Fortunately, there are always masters or saints in this world because there are always souls earnestly seeking the Lord and due in a particular human birth to return to him. The saint's presence cools this hot, heaving world. Baltu's Shabbat cuts through the worldly tangles of status, dogma, ritual, and mental analysis. His tone is gentle. In the court of Lord Opaldu, nothing counts except love and devotion. Love and devotion alone count, for they please him the most. He prefers a poor devotee's insipid food to a kingly feast. With all their penances and austerities, the rishis and munis, sure of their own piety and holiness, were put to shame when Shivri's loving offering of berries was accepted. Yudhishthra arranged a sacrificial feast to which all holy men were invited. Pride that day died for all. Without supich the bell would not ring. Forbear, therefore, says Paltu, from being proud of your high caste, and in the court of the Lord nothing counts except love and devotion. Baldu uses the metaphor of the monarch's court to describe Sachkhand. Even in this world, courtiers imitate their king and queen. Baldu is describing how man and God are one, but the veil of ego separates us for him, from him. Love alone can remove this veil. Our problem is that we identify with the veil or our ego structure the entire sense of I-ness and mindness, which has dragged us through so many incarnations. And not simply that me or I that is attached to so many things in this world, but also the lunatic ramblings of our mind. Someone once asked Maharaji if Kal, the negative power, has incarnated on this earth. And Huzur responded, well, Kal can do anything. You see, Kal can work through any human form. He's working through us. The mind is the agent of Kal, and of any mind under the control of Kal, you can say that he is working in the human form. I mean, after all, it is the mind which is the agent of Kal, and wherever mind dominates, Kal is dominating. He is working. And being human, we're all working under, under the domain of Kal, as dictated by him. Huzur also said, we're all slaves. We're dancing to his tunes. Our strings are at the back in his hand. And he pulls us from the back. And we're dancing according to his pull. And those strings are our karmas. And Kal is just sitting back. Through our karmas, he makes us dance. So when you go beyond the realm of mind and maya, trikuti, then you are free. Then you are beyond his reach, beyond his realm. Then he cannot force you to dance at all. Then you live in the will of the free, the Lord. The mind bombards us with desires, shame, guilt, the sense of being affronted, unhappy, comparison with others, the pain of attachment, loss, low self-esteem, the list goes on. And so we try to bury our self-awareness in distractions, TV, workaholism, 
alcoholism, drugs, other vices. And then, of course, the mind being ultimately a machine, a creature of habit, it becomes addicted to these things. This is the process of the mind being led by the senses through the nine lower gates of the body and beyond. Mind, the masters say, is the is bottomless in its desires. Time is change, and both mind and maya are subject to it. Therefore, the notion of permanent happiness or being satisfied when where particular desires are fulfilled is illusory. Because permanent happiness is not a part of the law of nature here. The great master describes this process. The world is a thick forest, thickly populated, where all have lost their way and are ceaselessly and aimlessly running about life after life, harassed by the great dacoits, lust, greed, anger, attachment, and pride. The remarkable thing about these dacoits is that people associate with them joyfully, and despite knowing that the result of their association is suffering, do not have the courage to disassociate themselves from them. They eat the poison, cry, and eat the poison again. It is ego which brings the other perversions of the mind in train. The so-called lust, anger, attachment, and pride. And if we didn't have such a strong sense of I-ness, of being the center of our own universe, who would there to be feeling who would there be to feel all that lust and anger? So the core of this sense of identity is the feeling that actually we are the most important person in the world to ourselves. And the saints teach that even our worldly love is based on selfishness and a desire to survive. So we must be cautious and vigilant in this deceitful world. Our friends and relatives are all about give and take. They are described by Swamiji as the outer swindlers and the inner swindlers are the five passions. Both steal the wealth of our attention. Paltu, however, speaks of love and devotion. Devotion is the path to love. The root meaning of devotion is from the Latin word vovere, to wow. The four wows taken at the time of initiation could be described as the four devotions. Devotion is the four vows in action because the essence of following the four vows means putting another interest before that ego. Devotion is a gift of God's grace. It tips the balance of our awful karmas in the right direction by setting our inclination towards the Lord. And we must not forget the grace of the Father. It is a nudge to enable us to make an effort. If we are devoted to following the four vows, we will change because we become how we think and behave. If the motivation of our actions, whether in the world or in our meditation, is putting others first, then we will have begun the process of loving of losing our identity and beginning to merge with another being. The great master wrote, the highest action and the highest quality in human life is devotion. If one doesn't practice it, his life is wasted. We practice devotion as a quality on this plane, whether it is our marriage, in our family, or in our working life. The doctor devoted to his patients and a mother devoted to her children. We instinctively recognize and do not respect devotion to self. We realize that devotion to self causes great harm in this world. The dictators we meet in every sphere of life, the tyrants who will have their own way. Devotion to the Lord is a great gift. The masters say that the angels are yearning for devotion to him, but such devotion cannot be obtained without a living, true master. 
The first step of our devotion is to the physical form of our master. When we meet him, we trust him because something in us recognizes something in him. In other words, our soul leaps up in recognition of a fully realized soul being. It is a deep calling to deep. We fall in love with him and we want to serve him. But if we are just attached to his physical form and that we do not do our spiritual practice, then our service becomes externalized and even dramatic because it is still on the emotional plane. Emotions change and shift, causing dramatic situations. Emotion is of the mind. It is the quiet practice of Surat Shabad Yoga which generates this transforming power of love. Love works any creature, even plants, trees, and insects. Receiving spiritual love from the Master and enables us to love in a spiritual way, and that spills over into loving the creation. By devotion to the sound current, the effects of both good and bad deeds, and the sense of identity which drives them away are burnt. When we start our meditation and try to concentrate at the eye center, we have been given holy names and a form that we are attracted to for contemplation. The Simran and the Master's form are not associated with our sense of identity, so the mind, with no familiar hooks to hang on to, quiets down and becomes calm. Through Simran, we reach that state of tranquility where we are not disturbed by good or bad things happening, regarding all as the Lord's will. This is the state of consciousness, not an intellectual decision. The Master so organizes our life as to enable us to reach a state of one-pointedness, an inner focus on the Master. The Master knows that as human beings, we all have the capacity for devotion, but it's spread out willy-nilly. One-pointed devotion, like the sun shining through a magnifying glass, can destroy a mountain of karma. One-pointed devotion becomes bire longing for the Lord. When the distraction of the mind calms down, the soul's yearning is at last truly felt. The soul has always been in a state of yearning and longing to reunite with the God, but those keen pangs have been muffled by the blanket effect of the mind and senses. Only spiritual practice can uncover this longing and set in motion the return home. The beauty of this is that any time is good for meditation. Any time is good for Simran and any place is good for Simran. We are not confined by buildings and rules. The masters love our effort in meditation. Great inner experiences without love or devotion for the master will lead us nowhere except straight back into the world with an expanded ego. Paltu in his Shabbat describes how the great rishis and seers attempted to attract Lord Rama's attention by outward ceremonies and dramatic displays of apparent self-denial. But Ram chose to share the berries of a poor woman, Shabri, berries which Shabri had already tasted to test for sweetness. Ram chose to spend his time with a humble devotee and ignored all notions of caste, behavior, and uncleanliness by eating her half-eaten food. Ram saw the motives behind everyone's behavior. Self-awareness drove the wise men, but love was the motive for Shabri's apparently unhygienic actions. The masters teach that motive is binding, and they can see our motives and true intentions like pickles in a jar. Baldu also refers to the Mahabharat in which, after the Great War is, was over, the Pandava brothers decide to hold a feast and invite many ascetics and, and holy men. Krishna tells them that their ceremony will not be complete until the bell rings in the heavens. The bell does not even ring when Lord Krishna himself goes to the feast. Krishna tells the brothers of the poor saint Supak that until the saints attend the feast, the ceremony is not complete and the bell won't ring. 
The Pandavas assume cynically that the poor man would be attracted by free food, but he is not. They issue a personal invitation, but he says that until he is given the benefit of 100 ceremonies, he will not come to the feast. The brothers realize that they haven't completed the feast, even one ceremony, never mind a hundred. Queen Draupadi then cooks some food and goes by herself barefooted to the saint's door, begging humbly for his attendance. Supak, seeing the purity of her heart and intention, does not pause even for a second and accompanies her to the feast and the bell in the heaven rings. Lord Krishna at the feast is like the omnipresence. But it was the Shabbat, the bell that rings in heaven. And that can only be heard for you through the intervention of a living saint. We can only benefit from his company if we are humble and loving. Otherwise, we will assume that he shares our way of thinking. The brothers thought that a poor man would be attracted by food and their interesting company. They were confusing love with worldly knowledge. We take one step towards the master and he takes 100 steps towards us. And those steps are not influenced by our caste, color, creed, status, lineage, or nationality. Pride that day died for all, says Paltu. The attendees at the feast realize the holiness of the world institutions and the lack of value of their own investment in those things. As a satsangi once wrote, we have to tune ourselves to a different chord to accomplish that task he gives us of the tuning fork of Simran and Bhajan. We demonstrate our real love by faithfully using those tools that he's given us. We have taken up a way of life which is a gradual refocusing of our attention so that the master may slowly become larger and larger on our mental horizon until that day when he becomes the whole view. Sardar Bharud Badur Jagat Singh Ji said in a discourse, Practice maketh a man perfect. Even though he starts with misgivings in due course, perseverance and sincere effort enable him to develop a strong fervor and piety. Mere show will lead him nowhere. An antidote for lack of devotion is more and more steadfast devotion. With unwavering faith in the master, devotion unfailingly leads to the realization of Nam the elixir against all suffering in the world. Swamiji lays stress on bhakti, that there is no other way to realize him and free the soul forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Shalina. That was amazing, Seva. I loved it. I loved listening. So now we can listen to our Holy Father, Ishwar Puriji. There's only one consciousness in which the soul is a participant. The mind is only one mind, but we all use it separately, individuate it, and think it's separate minds. This discovery of this truth is possible also by gurus, by masters who can take you to that point. They're very highly advanced masters. But the pure spiritual teacher, the one who takes you beyond the mind is very rare, extremely rare. Where will you find such a teacher? You only find it where such a student is there. Since the teachers, these perfect living masters come like ordinary beings, Obviously, we can't go around searching for them. Many may pass by you and you will never recognize them. How do we, if we want to really find a perfect master, how do we go about it? There is a very simple way of going about it. And that is, seek in your own heart, in your own mind. I want to meet you, perfect master, because I am tired of 
just came here. I have had enough. But you can only do that if you really had enough. But if you think, no, no, I have a lot of things to do, I have a lot of people to meet, I have a lot of work to do, I have, to have my ambitions to achieve, and go ahead and achieve everything. And when you are tired, say, no, I'm tired, now I want to go home. It's just like that. A man came to me once, he said, I have been hearing your talks on YouTube. And you are telling us, go within to your true home. I am a very happy man. I have a big house. I have a lot of money in cash and in the bank. I live a very wonderful life. And I am enjoying my life. Why should I meditate? I say, you don't need to meditate. Go and enjoy your wealth. Go and enjoy your life. That's your time to enjoy. I am not saying anything for you. In fact, if you ask me, I'll encourage you. Go and enjoy your life. My YouTube message is not for you at all. They're for wrong, other people, wrong people. You are the right person. Go and enjoy. <laughs> After one week, he comes again to me. He said, my life is miserable. I am in the greatest and happiest man. I said, what happened in one week? Last week you were so happy. He says, no, I didn't tell you. My girlfriend ditched me and left me. The other man cheated me of my money. He won't give me my money back. I have been disappointed so many times. My life is miserable. Only the outside things were good, so I only told you about the outside things. Inside I am miserable. When I hear these stories from people, and I hear them all over the world, I find that human beings have experiences of unhappiness. If they have no experience of unhappiness, why should they look for anything like spirituality? Spirituality arises from the fact that you have discovered this is not your place, that what you are experiencing here is not what you would desire. Your inmost self, your soul, your intuitive self is telling you this is not what you are, what you really are. Therefore, you want to go back to your true home. If that feeling is not there, you don't have to go to any satsang, any discourse, or read any spiritual book. Go and have a good time. So that is why there is always a trigger in our life which tells us the time is now. When the trigger comes, you say, I am tired, I know this is not my place, I want to go to my true home. Then you seek inside you. Seek inside. And I guarantee, after my almost more than 88 years of life on this planet, out of which more than 78 is after initiation by this man, I am telling you now that if you seek inside, a master will appear in your life. You don't have to search for him. He will search for you. He will search for you and appear. How will he appear? How will he know I am searching for him? If he doesn't even know who is searching for him, how is he a master? If he doesn't even know where you are, how is he your master? If he is earmarked to end your game, in this physical creation at a certain point and take you back home and doesn't even know about it, he cannot be a master at all. And if he knows about it, he has sufficient control over circumstances to create coincidences to bring you to him, create coincidences to meet you mm -hmm. and bring that spark in you and suddenly you meet, yeah. you say, this is what I was waiting for. You hear a few ordinary words from such a person, you say, this is what I was waiting for. Now I know, when a soul is desirous of going back to its true home, a sudden seeking comes inside. Actually, we are all seekers, but some are seeking slowly, patiently, <laughs> waiting for the time to come. Some are anxious to go quickly. Some say, our time is now. It's a certain stage of experiences. We have only come here wearing these different covers for experiences, no more. So when the experiences have tired us out, the soul is ready. It may be ready to go only to the first stage. A master of that stage will come. If you're ready to go beyond, a master will come there. If you found a master who took you to stage one, you are not satisfied. You say, this is not my journey. I didn't want just more pleasurable things. I wanted to go to my true home. Another master will appear. This is a natural phenomenon. Seeking is the secret. 
seeking inside, not shouting outside for a master. Seeking inside your own heart, inside your own mind. When you seek, the master appears by coincidence, by circumstances. And your mind, which has automatically attached itself to things around here, wants to stay here. It doesn't want to go in at all. You will notice that when you try to meditate, to sit within, which is simple, it's a very simple thing. When you have the power of attention and power of concentration, it should be the simplest thing to close your eyes and say, I'm sitting in the head behind my eyes, I'm a being there, and just imagine, it's very simple. But when you try to do that, the mind starts thinking of other things, even when it has not been thinking of those things at all. Mind takes you out, because mind's pleasures, it always seeks pleasure, is always being found outside. Therefore, the mind tries to go outside. And that is why the only obstacle to your spiritual growth is your own mind. There is nobody else stopping you. No other power stops you from going within your own self and discovering who you are except your own mind. And why? Because your mind has already accustomed itself to have the pleasures outside in these attachments, in these experiences. The mind will run after them. So every time you want to go within, the mind takes you out. When you meet a perfect master or a master up to the desired state of awareness that you want, that master will come in something inside your soul will say, intuitive self, not the thinking self. Intuitive self will say, that's what I was waiting for. And you feel pulled by that unconditional love. You'd like to spend time with that person. The mind will say, how can you be sure? The mind will create doubt. That's the business of the mind. It's a good programming. The mind has been programmed to create doubt for a good reason. If the doubt was not there, anybody could mislead you anywhere they like. So doubt is a good thing. Skepticism is a good thing on the spiritual path. People sometimes criticize skepticism. They sometimes criticize why we have doubts. But doubts are a good thing. It gives you an opportunity to remove your doubts. It gives you an opportunity to find the real reality and check out things. It does not take you blindly into something. If you have no doubt, you'll be a blind faith people. But doubt makes you go behind that, say, no, I want to study, I want to be careful. So when the mind doubts, you have more experience and you check it out. After a certain point, the love, an unconditional love of a master pulls you like nothing else does, and the mind is subdued. Mind begins to love it also. And then the journey begins. So this is natural occurrence. When you seek, masters appear. And they will take you back home at, in certain stages, depending upon how much preparation has been made in your life so far, in previous life so far. So, but it will happen. So there is no problem in finding a perfect living master. Just seek. He will appear in your life. I'm telling you, I have seen this throughout my life with the cases of all the seekers I have met. How they came on the path, all coincidences. How they met a master, all strange coincidences. Every story is unique. You hear from people and then you find that the master appears when we are ready. He may appear in stages. One master may appear and teach you one thing, another will take you a little higher, third may take you higher. But if your seeking is for the highest, you will get the perfect living master of the highest order. And that's a guarantee. Because he, the perfect living master, who is a perfect living master? He is your true self, the truest self. The truest self is only one. There are no two. The truest self that is making you believe you are an independent individual being. The same truest self appears as a master. It's your own true highest self appearing as an ordinary human being outside. It's nobody else. After all, if all this is maya, illusion, unreal, and we are looking at a master, also a human being, he's also maya, illusion, unreal. It's so obvious. If everything is unreal, how can then one, person, one piece of that unreality become real? Even the outside image we see of a master is unreal. As unreal as the rest of the world we are looking at. The reality of the master is inside us. When we go within, we find who that master was that we looked outside, because he was already inside. 
he was inside before he was outside ultimately we find there is no difference between the master and ourselves the seeker and the sought are the same that's the highest level of achievement that you can get through the spiritual path all these things i am talking are within the reach of a human being who is a seeker if you seek that state you will get that state it's as simple as that you have to fight only the mind nobody else there is no enemy of ours they are all people created for experience so that we can pay our accounts do it cheerfully live your life up and down cheerfully it's a platform given to us now why is it that we have to be human beings to have this experience why can't we have an experience when you're flying like a bird why can't we have an experience if we are an angel already in heaven why can't we have this experience in any other form the reason is that out of 8.4 million forms of life described in our ancient books the whole list is given 5.4 million is in is in plant kingdom only and then there is other species insects and mammals and angels they all all put together all forms of life have been put together including those we call gods have been put together wherever a soul has manifested in a form has been put together in that list of 8.4 million in that list there only the last highest list is 400000 species in that there is only one species a human being that has been given a unique gift called free will the power to seek no other form has this neither plants have nor birds have nor mammals have nor angels have nor gods have the power to be having a free will gods have knowledge how can they have free will if we knew what is happening tomorrow and day after if we already know now we we'll lose our free will immediately our ignorance is a blessing we don't know what's going to happen so we decide let me do this without knowing what we are going to do by deciding was already written up earlier we think we are deciding this feeling experience of free will not truly free but it's an experience nothing is true it's all experience the experience of free will the experience that i can make a choice the experience i can seek is unique to human beings and that's the experience that leads to realization of all your levels of consciousness including your true reality and this is a unique feature that is why i say the purpose of human life in which this unique property has been embedded into us the property to make a choice the property to seek that enables a human being to discover the entire reality of all levels of creation and to find the creator himself this is a great capacity based upon our experience of free will and that is why we make use of this that is the purpose of life that in no other form of life will you be able to do it and you can circulate yourself into 8.4 billion species of life and not have this opportunity which you have now when you are a human being <coughs> a man once went to my master folded his hands says master in my next next life please make me a human being master said are you a donkey now <laughs> why do you want to wait for next life opportunity is now when you are human being why are you thinking of next life why are you thinking that there is to be something happening later on this is the time when you should act they they published a pictorial record of my master's life or glimpses of great master a book in that they put a quotation of master he wrote in urdu jagdish milan ki biriya he says the time to find the lord is now not tomorrow not later when we get this opportunity when this clicks in our head when the seeking comes crack hit it hit the iron it's hot when you feel a seeking inside the mind will come up it will slowly there will be slow fight with the mind but at least you have started on the way eventually you'll reach your destination if you start if you don't start procrastinate i am too busy now maybe tomorrow i'll start 
or maybe when I retire, I'll start. Maybe this is not the time I have to bring up my children, I can't start now. If all the excuses of the mind are acceptable by us, we'll never start. Time will just go by. One day we'll say, I'm going to start, and next day we'll die. And we'll say, why didn't I start? Well, next time we'll do it. Next time you'll forget about the past life, you start all over again, and perpetuate this birth and rebirth again and again. Therefore, when such a trigger comes in our mind, this is the time to start. Do it. Don't wait. Don't waste a moment. Start from wherever you are. Start in whatever way. Perfectly way, Master will come in your way and guide you right up to your true home. I have noticed that there are a large number of people who have asked for personal time, what we call the interviews. Uh, how many of you here would like to have a personal time, one-on-one -on -one with me? Please raise your hand. Wow. <laughs> now, now, based on the time frame and the program they had made, uh, I don't know how we can accommodate. We have had the same problem in other events also. And I feel very sorry that we make a list of people and then we go one by one and then we can't complete the list, then I have to leave for the next destination. It makes, it leaves me a little unhappy that I could not give time to people who really wanted to talk to me. Therefore, I suggested to Rick Burgett that I'll check uh, um, just by raise of hands, and now I've just seen myself. So I'll try to do this, that I'll try to devote more time to this one-on-one, -on -one, uh, rather than just keep on giving you more talks. So if you agree, I'll give more time for these interviews or personal meetings and uh, less time for a general talk. I've already given you the general talk. And if you think I, you need more general talks, uh, Mark says there are 220 talks on YouTube. <laughs> talks are easy. You can hear any one of them. You can also read books. They say the same thing. I have said nothing new. So I, I'll try to arrange that I see as many as I can. I would like to see those who are seeing me for the first time. So he is going to put those names ahead of all the others. I believe you agree. They should be given the first chance. Then some people have come from overseas, from other countries. They traveled far off to come to see me. And we should give them a chance. So Rick is going to put that name next. And then time permitting, we'll see as many others that, that we can. And some people have mentioned about initiations. There will be no time for that during this visit here, but if one is interested and wants to ask about it, the best opportunity is always on the 2nd of April, which is the Bandara day, the day when my master transitioned from physical body into my radiant form forever. That was a great day, and we celebrate it uh, in Wisconsin somewhere. We have been doing it in Rice Lake and Bruce and Mequon. Now we'll see which will be the next place uh, mostly in Wisconsin State and USA. And that, uh, uh, that's the best time if you want, if you're interested. Meanwhile, prepare yourself. If you're in a hurry, there may be an opportunity for some next month in September or at a meditation workshop we'll be having, during which we'll be meditating, but then at that time also I'll take up a few cases like that. So these are the two opportunities, but there won't be time for that here. So I'm only mentioning this right now, because some people may have that expectation that there will be initiations uh, in this trip. There won't be initiations in this trip. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We'll take a little break. And I want to uh, say that if you have any questions, general questions to ask, if you have a personal question, you can reserve them for personal meeting. If a general question to ask, you can write them down. Do you have that arrangement uh, for small pieces of paper on which you can write your questions and I'll try to answer those. Uh, I'd like you to join me in a little meditation. Would you like to? Yes. How many of you want to do meditation with me? I'm very happy. You know why? Because that is better than talk. <laughs> that is actual practice. That even though it may be little practice, at least it is a practice in the right direction. So we will do a little meditation now before we break for lunch. This, uh, before we start the meditation, 
uh, how many of you have never done meditation with me? Please raise your hand. Who never done any meditation with me? Okay. So I'll start with the, some experimental uh, exercises that I normally do before we start meditation. There's a purpose for them, I'll explain to you. We'll do a couple of exercises. First exercise, which many of you have done, and if you'd like to join again, you can do it again with me, is called the orange juice experiment. How many have done the orange juice experiment with me? Oh, many of you have done already. And some of you may be able to go do it today. In this experiment, it's an imaginary experiment. We will use our imagination because imagination is a very valuable thing in meditation also. Then you have to imagine you are inside the head, it's an imagination. So imagination is a powerful instrument. And to practice that powerful instrument of imagination, we are going to do an imaginary exercise. In this imaginary exercise, we will imagine that our body is made of glass and it's hollow from inside. It's a hollow shaped vessel, hollow like a body, and we are going to fill up that hollow body with orange juice. All the way from the feet, from the toes of the feet, all the way up to the top of the head, and right up to the end of the fingers and the arms, we'll fill up the whole body, imaginary orange juice. We will also know that in this exercise, our finger, tips of the fingers have valves. When we press them, the orange juice flows out. When we don't, it stays inside. That kind of valve is there. We also have similar valve in our toes. When we press the toes, the orange juice goes out. When we don't, it stays inside. So this is the arrangement that the whole glass body has valves on the fingertips and on the toes. And we, I will give you instructions from time to time what to do. Now, you have to sit in a still position. You can't be moving around because then the glass body will crack. <laughs> so you have to stick with this imaginary game. In this imaginary game, be still <clears throat> in your position where you are. No movement. Close your eyes. You can rub your eyes and hands, feet, because during meditational exercises, we will experience this withdrawal from the body again and again. So to get back to the physical body, the physical experience, it's easy to do it like this. It comes back faster. Okay. I do it just to, by routine. How many of you were able to do this experiment? Very good. How many had difficulty doing it? Not many. We'll experiment again sometime. But most of you did very well. Did you understand the purpose of this exercise? That you were able to use your attention in any part of the body as I was speaking to you. When I said stop here, you stopped at that point. That means the attention which you just used. That's the secret. The secret to good meditation is the use of the very attention you just used. And you used it everywhere where you liked, according to the instructions I was giving. It was entirely in your control. It's the same attention that we will be using in meditation. But before we meditate, we'll do one more exercise. It's again an exercise in imagination. In this imaginary exercise, we will again close our eyes. And this time, put our attention behind the eyes and think this is a room, a chamber we are sitting in. That this body is our house. It's not our body, it's not our self. It's a house in which we live. The house has six floors based upon the six energy centers, six chakras below us. We are at the two petal lotus behind the eyes and the other chakras, the energy centers below us. And behind the eyes, we have our nice chamber the floor is right at the eye level and we're sitting on top of that floor in the center. When we sit in the center, we'll, have, we'll be between the two ears. We'll imagine we are between the ears 
and equally distant from the front and the back and not exactly, don't have to look for the space, but just a feeling that you are in the head sitting there. When you are sitting there, you are sitting on a nice chair, sit on a nice chair, better than what you got here or the same type. It's free. Pick up any chair and sit on the chair in the center of the head. On your right side, have a table like this one, like I have here. Yes. Side table on the right side. On that table, place a vase or vase of flowers, like this. Not necessarily these flowers, your favorite flowers. Put the favorite flowers next to you and a nice drink in a cup of your choice and drink of your choice on the side and a small plate, small plate with some nice snack, your favorite snack. So all this has to be done inside the head. Then you're sitting in the center, imaginary, it's all imaginary exercise. You imagine you're sitting in the center, on the side there's a table, and on the table you've got flowers, a drink, and a snack. Then I will give you instructions what to do next. Close your eyes. Go to the sixth floor of your house, behind the eyes. How many of you are able to see flowers? How many saw the flowers change colors while you were watching? How many had never seen these flowers before? Good. How many were able to smell those flowers? How many recognized the fragrance? How many felt it was new? How many of you could taste the drink? How many of you recognized it? How many of you felt it was new? How many tasted the snack? How many liked the taste? How many still have taste in their mouth now? Very good. There were no flowers. There was no drink. There was no snack. You still have the taste of the snack in your mouth. What was the purpose of this experiment? The purpose of the experiment was the sensory perceptions of seeing, touching, tasting, smelling are all inside us and do not belong to the physical body at all. The physical body had nothing to do with it. This experiment was done with imagination and you were able to recreate all sense perceptions in this little experiment. You will notice that who was it that smelled the flowers? Who was it that tasted the snack? Who sipped the drink? Any answer? Did you recognize who was doing it? How many recognized somebody else was doing it in the head? Somebody did it. You're all raising your hand that you got all this experience. It was not this body. Then who was doing it? Step one. It is step one of realizing that you are that which had that experience and not this body. That experience looked imaginary to you. Why was it imaginary? Because this is real. Therefore, it was not this, therefore that must be imaginary. Your attention was 95% in this body when you did this exercise. Supposing you were to put 95% of attention on that experiment, this body will become imaginary and that will become real. You can test it out. The reality is not being created by something real. Reality is being created by the percentage of attention you put into it. We are putting 100% attention on this physical body and physical experience. We take it as real. You withdraw attention to something else, that will become real. Reality doesn't exist as we think it does. There is nothing real except our own self. It has the experience. Ultimately, you'll find the only reality is the self, the experiencing self. The experience is not real. But we make the experience real and make ourselves unreal. We do the reverse. The reality is created by experience. And therefore, the amount of attention which comes from consciousness operating through the mind, the 
the attention we place, when we put all attention on something, it becomes totally real. When we withdraw attention, it, become, it disappears, it becomes unreal. And something else becomes real. This is a continuous process going on. We go to sleep every night, we become unconscious of the body and become conscious of a dream body. We wake up in the morning, it's a normal function. If you meditate, the other thing will become normal for you to go into higher reality. Then open up a higher reality, you'll enjoy that, know that's longer, and go back into this like sleep. It's as simple as that. It's the process of shifting attention from one level to another. Shifting from one set of experiences to another. And this body is merely one level, but it's very interesting level. Because the physical body, the reality appears more real because of the free will. We can choose to go to the other level, we can choose to sleep, though we really can't. When we're very sleepy, we fall asleep, but we think we choose to sleep, otherwise we wake up. The fact that we feel we can choose, make choices, does not exist in the dream body, does not exist in the astral body, does not exist in the causal body, exists only in the human body, physical human body. Makes it unique. It does not mean that every higher experience is higher. Somebody sometimes asked me, which would you prefer? To go to a heaven in the astral plane or stay here in the physical plane? I said, stay here. I make choices. There I'll be a robot. I just live by the program. Here also living by the program, but I don't know it. The program includes that you will think and say you will decide this. That's part of the program, but I don't know it. So I take it as real. I enjoy it. I make my destiny here. I make my future. So this is so amazing, this whole system. System of life and creation, system of life and having experiences. Most wonderful game. Experience it. Move about from one level to another. At, at will. Where is your will? Human, human wakeful state. This you cannot do if you are sleeping. You cannot do when you are in higher state of consciousness. You cannot do it in heaven. You can do it here as a physical human being, cut off from knowledge of the future. Ignorant. Ignorance is a bliss that you feel you have the choice. No matter how unreal the choice is, you take it as real. I tell the story of an actual experience of mind with a guy in uh, India. Uh, I had appeared for the Indian Navy. And after doing my interview from the Navy, I came out. This was in a town called Lucknow. And I came out and a man in a turban was talking to me, saying good luck. I had met another man also who said good luck. And I said, why are you saying good luck in English when I, we are both Punjabis? But he said, because you have good luck. So he predicted something, which he came out right. But this man was different. He said, do you have a piece of paper? I said, yes, I have. I was carrying paper for my interview. I gave him a little piece of paper. And he said, you have a pen? And yeah, here's a pen, pencil. So he began to look at me and write something. And then he folded that paper, gave me my pen back, folded it two, three times, said, hold it in your hand. So I held it in my hand. Then he said, you have another paper? <laughs> yes, keep this hold, hold in your hand. Now on that paper, write a number between one and 10. I thought, this is an old game. Even I used to play with other children when I was a child, that when you tell children, write number quickly between one and 10, they all write five. The mind works in the middle. So I said, he's expecting me to write five. And I'm not going to write it. I'm going to call off his bluff, this game I've seen before. So I wrote three. He said, write the name of a flower. And the most common flower is rose, kulab. And I thought he's expecting me to write that. I am going to write the name of a flower. This is UP, Lucknow. He has never heard of it, of a Punjabi flower. So I thought of a flower, jasmine, called chameli. So I wrote in English, C-H-A-M-E-L-I, 
Chabeli. He said, no, write your date of birth. So I wrote 1926. He said, that is the year of birth. I said, date. So normally we write date first of the year afterwards, but I had already written the year, so I wrote the date 26 November after that. He said, now open the paper I gave you earlier. Open the paper. It said 3, Chameli, 1926, and then the date. Exactly in the order in which I wrote. I was completely stunned. How can this person know when I haven't even thought out something? It is not that he could read my mind. How could he read my mind beforehand? I was still in a state of shock. Then he said to me, shall I tell you something more? I said, please go ahead. <laughs> he said, when I asked you to write a number between 1 and 10, you said, I am going to call off his bluff and write 5. Not write 5, which he expects me, and I will write 3. He knew exactly my thought. And when I said, write a flower, you thought, He's expecting me to write rose and I'm not going to write rose, so I'm thinking of another flower. He repeated my thoughts. Thoughts that he could not have known because I'd never thought them. How could he know precisely my thoughts before I thought them? That was one of the best proofs I ever got. That what we think and believe it is new is also not new. That when we make a choice, say, I am going to do this, I have to decide whether I will go there tomorrow or not. And now I am deciding I will not go. That this is my decision, unknown to anybody prior to this moment, is already known to somebody who's got a record of it. And who that somebody? Our own self in our record. There are so many amazing things that we discover that what we call free will is an experience, special experience given to human beings to find the truth. It's not a real experience because nothing is real. It's part of the unreality, but it's a part of unreality that makes you get into reality. There was a Swami, more than 110 years ago, he came to Chicago. His name was Swami Vivekananda. Swami Ramakrishna's disciple, favorite disciple. He came there, poor man, found by a lady sitting outside who took her, an American lady who took him to his house. He began to talk a lot of spiritual things. He said, I am a member of a group. We are going to have a great Congress of Religions. Come and speak there. So, this young sadhu from India was invited to speak in the World Congress of Religions in Chicago. And he made a speech, then he made another speech. People loved him. They gave a standing applause. Third day he said, I have been telling you that this world is unreal. It's mithya, maya, illusion. If this is all illusion that you are looking at, then you are looking at me, I must also be illusion. How come I am talking to you like it's something real, when I am also saying it's illusion, I myself am illusion. He said, I am also an illusion like everything else, with one difference. The rest of the illusion draws you to itself and holds you here. This illusion is pushing you back into reality and saying, go back. That's the only difference. So we discover that everything, this world was not created in time. It was in non-time, instant, everything was declared. You can go there to that instant. You can, anybody can go there because there's no anybody, there's only one. When you realize you are that one, you come to know that. You come to know of the instant of creation. All free will, everything that we talk of, billions and billions of years and billions of galaxies and all that, one second, one moment, not even a second. And we can reach that second and know that what we say, we are moving, thinking, deciding these things, all predetermined. 
Now, when I say this thing, everything is predetermined, I still get emails saying, well, I can decide to follow you or not to follow you. How can you say it's predetermined? Then when you say, should I follow you or not follow you? That's also predetermined. When you ask me, is it predetermined or not predetermined? Even that is predetermined. <laughs> the thing is, when the whole thing is programmed into consciousness and is played out like this, you will see it exactly like it's played out like reality. We can put it another way. They say life is a stage. Shakespeare said that. The world is a stage, we are mere actors and players on it. Which is true. Life is a play, we are acting on it. But we are good actors. What is the definition of a good actor? A good actor is one who forgets that he is an actor. If he remembers an actor, he is not a good actor. If a barber becomes a king, he will continuously sharpen his razor even as a king. Because he will still know I am the barber, only acting. But if he begins to think he is a king, he will act very well as a king. There was a movie made Gandhi, in which a British actor, Ben Kingsley, acted as Gandhi. During an interview in India, he said, People wanted to shoot the movie. I held them back. I said for six months, I must feel I am Gandhi, then shoot. Every day he said he woke up and he began to feel he was Gandhi. Then he was felt absolutely identical. Then he said, now shoot. The success of a real good play is how natural the acting is. And we are such good actors, such natural actors, because we have all forgotten we are actors. We have taken our roles so seriously. We go by the script naturally. And we think in the same way like we are destined to think. And this is, therefore, it's a play in which we are acting as best actors, according to a script which can be written, but we don't read it now because we memorized it. This is a programming. And therefore, free will is part of the experience. If you want to go above free will and see what it is, go, that's there also. People come to me, why has God given me such bad karma and that person has good karma? I said, you could ask God, why did he do it? And God will not answer you. If he answers, he will say, I didn't give you, you did it. It's your karma, not mine. Why are you blaming me? You say, how can it be mine? Everything they say is created by God. He says, if God created everything, I can show you your actions by which you are having this karma. Look back. You look back, oh, they were my actions. But God, how can, how can you say that you created everything? Why are you blaming me for those actions or for this? He says, no, I did not create you. You are creating me. God has not created us, we are creating God. Did you know that? God is a concept. We all created God as a concept. The creator is a concept for us. We want to worship somebody. We, we have a very low opinion about ourselves because we think we are the body. When we discover who we are, to, in the inmost self, when we discover that the God was the one that was our inmost self, that there's only one. There are no two. Nobody can see God unless you are God. Because when you reach the point of total God, you are only one. How can there be somebody to see? If you are able to see, you are creating that God. That is why this whole game is of totality of consciousness. That's the creative power. And the creative power currently in the physical world is sitting right accessible to us within ourselves. What else do we want? That the highest creative power, given any name, God, Allah, Parmeshwar, whatever you call it, sitting right inside and is your own reality. Don't believe it? Check it out. It's not a matter of debate. It's a matter of going within and checking it out. That's the beauty of the spiritual path. I say this man gave me the beauty because he said, Nothing is to be accepted in blind faith. Nothing has to be accepted because I am saying it. 
accept what you experience yourself develop faith based upon every day's experience you can take one step of belief okay i am here maybe there is something outside the door i open the door there is nothing i come back no there was nothing i don't believe anything else if i see something yes i can take the next step but every step of faith real faith should be based upon experience a living faith like other things the life they grow faith should grow like that with every event that we go on. therefore we should have a living faith no blind faith somebody said it i believe it that's blind faith his religion has today become a following of blind faith somebody said it we believe it how have we checked it out have you experienced what we are believing how can it be good faith faith must be based upon your own experience believe only little bit if you have little experience believe little experience and move from there to the next one but don't say i believe the whole story somebody told me is still a story and let me tell you all descriptions of spirituality are stories because they can't be described the only way to make us understand as human beings is to tell stories how can you describe anything that lies beyond time and space there no description for it how can you describe the totality of consciousness when there is no description how can you say there is no separation when we are watching separation all the time how can you talk of these concepts these highest truths when the experience right here is totally different we can't fit them in that is why we make stories swami ji said shiv dayal singh in whose name radha swami faith was created in agra he used to give his sat sangs there are in such kind our true home tall trees laden not with fruits with diamonds and rubies and precious stones many ladies attended his sat sangs <laughs> obviously <laughs> now where there is no time and space how can there be trees how can there be diamonds it's just there no other way to describe it so we are using stories using examples which with the mind can understand with with the examples we have here to show you it is different to show you it is separate to show you it's not what you think it is there's a stories stories are told only for examples well i have talked enough i'll take you into few minutes of meditation now are you ready in this first session of meditation again we go back to the same place which will be the basic starting point for all meditation that this is your body not you this is your house your vehicle which you are driving but not you in a stationary meditation you can assume it's a house you are sitting on the sixth floor of the house and in the center and how many of you have a mantra or a simran or repetition that you know of how many of you don't have any mantra or any simra anything to repeat those who don't have anything can for this exercise coin a small mantra coin a few words three or four five words expressing your love for your beloved that's all just make it Let's try today meditation behind the eyes 